All right. Well, good afternoon. We are pleased to welcome you to the Washington Labs Academy webinar series. We hope you find the next hour or so useful and informative. Our presenter has agreed to answer questions at the end of the webinar. So I'm asking if all can please place questions in the chat box and I'll make sure I read it to the presenter. And now I'd like to introduce our presenter. Matthias Lorick is a manager of Brand Simulations Electronics team. Matthias works with customers to achieve their goals through identifying critical needs and delivering the correct solutions through simulation. Prior to RAN simulation, Matthias was a senior RF engineer, helping customers across all industries solve their antenna, RF, and EMI related problems. Matthias has a Master of Science in Electrical Engineering degree from the University of Minnesota with a focus on antenna design, power electronics, and sustainable energy systems. So without further ado, let's all turn our attention to leveraging and simulations for 5G antenna deployment with Matthias Larick. Hi, Matthias, it is all yours. Take it away. Hi, Kim. Thanks so much. And Thank you to thanks again to Washington Labs for for having us uh, present here today. I'm really excited to um, have the opportunity to uh, present today on this topic. Um, it's an area that um, I'm very passionate about, and really excited to to educate you all and provide some insights into this realm. So, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Is Ms. Kim, Kim, would you be able to confirm this is coming through okay? Yes, perfectly. Perfect, great, all right. Uh, so like Kim mentioned, uh, the topic of our webinar today is leveraging ANSYS simulation for 5G antenna deployment. Um, so when it comes to the 5G space, particularly around antenna designs, there's a lot of different considerations um, that need to come into play. Uh, 5G is fantastic because we can, you know, get more greater data rates, but that comes with some particular design challenges. Um, so any customers um, or anyone who's particularly, you know, cognizant or actively working inside of this space, um, some of these things I think will be particularly relevant. So let's move right along. All right, so first we're going to go through a overview. Um, and this overview... Um, first, we're going to just talk a little bit about RAN Simulation, the, the organization that I work with, um, just kind of give you guys a little bit of background about who we are, what we do, um, and how we could also potentially help you all out um, with your simulation needs. And then we're going to go right into kind of an overview about 5G antennas. Um, and then we're going to dive into the, the meat of our discussion, which is around the ANSYS high frequency solutions for, for these types of antennas. So we're going to talk about how, you know, what HFSS is. Um, what the ANSYS Electronics desktop is, what it looks like, um, what it's able to achieve. And then we're going to show a couple of examples of how we can actually use some of the functionality built into HFSS to ideate antennas almost essentially on the fly, um, as well as seeing how antennas interact between themselves, especially when we're talking about antennas that are on the same printed circuit board or within the same device. Um, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about specific absorption rate, which is something that always be, can be a consideration when we have wireless devices, as well as, you know, we have a deployment, uh, say we're building a small scale network. Um, but in the simulation realm, we need to do a large scale simulation. So how can we implement that? And what are the, the different types of implementations that we can leverage there? And then we'll also touch on a little bit inside of the uh, emissions around enclosures, EMI, and uh, susceptibility. And then like Kim mentioned at the end, we will um, have some questions. So let's go right into it. So just want to take a little bit of time and talk about um, my organization. So I work for a company called RAN Simulation. Um, we are what's called an ANSYS elite channel partner. And what that means is, is that we have partnered with ANSYS. ANSYS is uh, the biggest simulation company in the world um, for all different physics, not just electromagnetics, but structurals, fluids, optics, um, any sort of design challenge um, that you may be facing, there's definitely an application inside of simulation um, that we could help you guys out. 
So what we do is we help solve your problems um, resulting, whether it be from like maybe a little bit of an insufficient design um, or, you know, a procedure that could be improved, or maybe you're just trying to squeak some, you know, additional performance out of a product or you're moving into a new realm that you um, are unfamiliar with, or you're pushing the limits of something that you already have. Um, simulation can really help uncover and un help you understand, you know, trends in your design and then further, um, optimize across those designs. And the way that we do that with customers is we help you uncover those insights early on in your design process. And by using that best in class ANSYS software, we're able to develop a unique collaborative approach to solve those design problems. All right, so going into our 5G antennas overview. Um, so in, in general, 5G is kind of a broad term. Um, we have a number of different frequency ranges um, that kind of fall under the 5G space. So we have what's called 5G NR or new radio. That's going to fall within that two to six gigahertz bandwidth um, range. You know, traditionally, if you're familiar with LTE or GSM, um, those are going to be kind of typically around that, you know, 500 megahertz up to around, you know, two gigahertz range. Um, so 5G NR is kind of falling in the, a little bit of a higher space, kind of similar to what you would find around inside of Bluetooth and, uh, you know, your Wi-Fi at home. But there's also a um, much higher frequency set of in millimeter waves. So that's when you think of, you hear a 5G with a lot of different beam steering, or you have really high data throughputs, very short distances that those uh, signals need to cover, but it allows, you know, lightning fast speeds. Um, those can be solved at, you know, much higher, or those are, those implementations are at much higher frequencies, you know, 24 to 40 gigahertz typically. So what are some of kind of the benefits of 5G or the antennas around 5G? Um, like I mentioned, is the increased data throughput for these users. Um, everyone's trying to stream wherever they are. Uh, more and more data gets pushed through. Data protocols are always pushing the limits and speed. And that comes with a number of different challenges, both from like a signal integrity perspective of routing that on the board, but also the implementation of the antennas themselves and how they interact with their environment. So in this realm, we often see a lot of different directionalities with antennas. You know, if we take a, like an, a, some, a device like your phone, we want that to be relatively, you know, omnidirectional, which means that it can radiate in every direction. But say we have a small cell network that we're just trying to cover a certain area, we can design antennas to make sure that we're focusing the, you know, the gain or the beam of that antenna in the, into the areas that we want. Um, so the, the caveat with those higher data throughputs um, and those higher frequencies is, is that the shorter wave, or excuse me, the benefit of the uh, shorter wavelengths is, is that it allows us to require smaller antennas. So an antenna resonates at a fraction of its wavelength. So the shorter the wavelength, the higher the frequency, which allows us to now scale down the size of our devices to um, allow for new ideas that we haven't thought up before. So this really comes into play with like the internet of things, making everything connected or developing a, you know, a small cell network where we're trying to provide coverage into a specific area, whether that be a building or a city block. Um, but one of the couple of the challenges that come from that is, you know, we have to make sure that our antennas are working how we expect. So when, if you're developing a 5G NR radio, or excuse me, for 5G NR radio or antenna, you're going to be subjected to different test uh, performances, uh, different performance tests imposed by these different carriers. So you're going to need to make sure that your antenna's radiation pattern is providing sufficient gain so that the radiated power of your device is within the acceptable limits. Um, if it's not radiating well enough, it's not going to perform well on the network. And if it doesn't perform well on the network, you're going to drop a signal. And if you have a dropped signal, who are you going to blame? You're probably going to blame the carrier. So the carrier doesn't want that to, um, you know, fall back onto them. So they want to make sure that all the devices that are allowed on their network are performing up to their standards. And that comes into play as well on the receiver sensitivity side. So a device needs to be able to listen and hear very, very small RF signals, much, much smaller than what was originally transmitted from a transmitter, you know, a nearby tower, for example. And so how do we make sure that that's the case? Well, the antenna performance is important. The better the antenna can receive the signal, 
the more gain that that's going to be imposed inside of what we call our link margin. Um, the other part of that though is, is the actual EMI, the noise. So an example that I like to give people is, is let's imagine we're um, you know, just standing in a quiet room and I were to whisper to you and you can hear me whispering. That is essentially like the minimum noise floor, the minimum sensitivity of a radio that it can receive. That's its minimum sensitivity. But now say we go to a uh, concert and it's really loud all around us. You can't hear my whisper anymore. That concert you can think of as the noise floor all around your device that's caused by switching power supplies, fast switching traces, other antennas that are transmitting that's coupling into the, the band of you know, your other antenna, other sources of VMI, other ear, nearby devices that are causing interference, and that can all impact your sensitivity. So being cognizant of that is also really important when you're designing for these antennas, making sure that you're providing your antenna an environment around it that is quiet um, so that you're not going to uh, inflate your, near, your, your ambience or your essentially, you know, your nearby noise floor uh, excessively. And simulation can be leveraged as well uh, from a multitude of different ways to, to help benefit and understand and reduce those issues. But other challenges, and this isn't just for 5G, but this is for all wireless devices that are nearby a human, is specific absorption rate. I believe it's if your device is going to be planned to be within 20 centimeters of the human body, whether that's the head, the torso, the hand, any part of the human body, you're going to be subjected to the specific absorption rate, or SAR which is how much energy is actually getting absorbed into your body and converting into heat. Another challenge is, is that we have to, you know, with those, especially these high frequencies, it can require a direct line of sight or, you know, very reduced amounts of multipath. So multipath can become problematic, especially at multi millimeter wave frequencies um, inside of this domain. So helping understand as well how that propagates within the environment. These are the types of things that we can lean to within uh, by leveraging simulation with ANSYS. So let's go into what does a typical uh, simulation look like? So inside of uh, what we've got here, this is the ANSYS electronics desktop, which is the integrated desktop for all of ANSYS's EM related simulation tools. So HFSS, it stands for High Frequency Structure Simulator, and it's able to be simulated or any different type of RF structure that you think of. So whether that's in a waveguide, whether that's an antenna, whether that's a trace on a printed circuit board or a coaxial transmission line. Um, if, you, if it's a high frequency structure, HFSS is able to simulate it and simulate it with best in class accuracy. So this is just kind of what would happen if we opened up a design inside of the electronics desktop. So we have our, our electronics desktop window um, we have what we call our model or window here. So this is what our model is. So this could be something that you ideated and drew up directly within this. This is an integrated modeler that uses history-based modeling. So you can come up here and draw a bunch of different shapes. You can manipulate them, move them around, duplicate them, split them around, do whatever you want to create your antenna design from scratch. Or you can import that in as a native CAD format. So like a step file, um, an STL file, you know, parasolids, SolidWorks, um, et cetera. But once we have that model in, we have a nice organization here of every different object within, as well as what the material is assigned to each of those objects. So since this is solving Maxwell's equations within this simulation domain, which is kind of denoted by this little green box that you can kind of see outside of this, uh, Device. This is essentially a cell phone. We've got our battery, printed circuit board, some memory traces, a GPS antenna, a excuse me, a GPS antenna is here, a Bluetooth antenna, and a cellular antenna. Everything gets organized because everything's going to be meshed and simulated by the solver. Um, over here on the left, we've got uh, a what we call our project manager that hosts um, our designs. So we have a design inside of a project. And we can put many designs inside of a single project. So if you're thinking up a bunch of different ideas, you can save it all into a single project. But this is also where we have our different boundary conditions. So what do we want to apply to different surfaces? Like, do we have a special coating on our antenna that has you know, a very, very thin finish? We can apply a boundary to uh, reflect that. 
or maybe we want to, you know, see the radiation pattern. So we want to have all the fields calculated and solved at those boundaries. So we can put a radiation boundary around it. Um, we also can see where our excitations are. So we can see here, we've got Bluetooth, cellular, GPS, some memory, and a couple USB traces. All of those are excitations inside of our design. And what that's doing is, is with all of those excitations, we are able to extract not only the fields that are solved within this, but also the S parameters. And what S parameters are, are essentially an RF representation of whatever is connected to that port. So if, for example, we have an antenna here, we can see how much that antenna reflects back when a signal is sent to it. So that's like get a figure of merit called return loss or VSWR or VSWR for uh, antennas. How well does it transmit all of the, um, or how much does the power reflect and how much does it actually leave the antenna? We also can see a, uh, you know, a transmission loss. So we can see how this antenna couples into this antenna or how this trace couples into one of these antennas. That matrix is being solved within this uh, analysis when we perform it. And the last thing that I'll touch, or the last couple things that I'll touch on on this slide here is, is that HFSS comes with a large library of different models ready to go for your different needs. So if you're trying to create different types of, you know, EMC tests, whether that be uh, like a conducted emissions, or you want to put in different test antennas a di certain distance away from your device to see how it's performing. Or if you want to bring in different human body um, objects like an arm or the whole head or the entire body itself, um, those things are in integrated as well, as well as a number of different um, vendor provided um, antennas. So that's another benefit as well, that if you maybe you're not designing your antenna, but you are buying one off the shelf, many vendors are creating encrypted models that you can bring inside of HFSS, place it down onto the model of your PCB. You can bring all of your other things around it, like your enclosure, your battery, all your other devices that could interfere and change the, uh, the performance of that antenna, and then see what that result would look like. But say you're customizing it and you're designing it yourself, and you're drawing it maybe from scratch inside of uh, HFSS, which many, many antenna designers, that is their workflow. Um, the ability to parameterize and design or change the design variables of these different structures. So when you're drawing it up, you can assign variables to the different dimensions as you go, which you can then put through a design of experiments or a parametric study to see, oh, if I move this arm a little bit this way, or if I make this a little bit wider, or if I make my antenna a little bit longer, what does that do to my performance? Do I get better gain? Does my, my uh, frequency response shift in up or down? What am I seeing from there? So this is just a general overview of ANSYS HFSS. But even for people who are just getting started, um, we actually have an extension built into the tool. Um, so say, for example, you're just like, I just want to see what uh, you know a simple antenna would look like, or maybe I'm just getting started on developing um, into this realm. Maybe I'm de de uh, designing a small cell site, and I just want to kind of figure out, get an idea of what uh, types of antennas I want to look through. We have an ANSYS AT, ACT extension called the HFSS Antenna Toolkit. So over here on the, the right, we have a list of different antenna types that we can choose from. We've got like bow ties, dipoles, helixes, yagis, patch antennas, um, a whole different list. And from that, we just select a specific antenna type that we want. And then we come over here. Um, into this section, and all we ever really need to do is just specify kind of the frequency that we really want this antenna to work at, and then click synthesis, and then that's going to auto-populate all of the dimensions in, for that specific antenna type, and then once we click finish, it's going to auto-generate a model and all of the solutions set up, as well as all of the different, you know, typical antenna-like uh, plots that you'd like to see. So you get your, your radiation pattern plots. You can see that both in the 2D cross-sectional view as well as in a 3D view. You also can look at the, you know, the Smith chart response for your S parameters, like I mentioned before. Um, the closer you are to the center of the Smith chart, the less energy gets reflected away. Um, but, um, you know, intended designers will use the Smith chart, but they also might like to look at the return loss, which is essentially the exact same thing. 
it's showing you the representation of the um, antenna is impedance, but in a logarithmic um, magnitude scale versus frequency. So when you're ever looking at like an antenna's data sheet, you'll probably see a plot that looks similar to this and probably some that looks similar to this. So the gain is telling you how much um, gain that antenna is over different angles. So gain is a, com is a proportion of what gets built into that link margin that I mentioned earlier. So what a link margin is, so say think you have two antennas. Each antenna has a respective amount of gain. One antenna has a transmit power. The other antenna that's receiving has a receiver sensitivity. There's also a distance between those two antennas that we call our RF path loss. So between you know, the gain, the transmit power, and the gain of the receiver, all of those kind of you know improve your link margin. So the more gain you have and the more power, that's going to increase your link margin. But then the, the further away you are, the more multipath that you're experiencing, that's going to increase your um, excuse me, that's going to reduce your link margin. It's going to make more loss between point A to point B from transmitter to receiver. So optimizing the gain can be important. Um, and also understanding, am I optimizing that gain in the right direction? You know, if you want this device to be going up, you're probably not going to want to use a dipole. But if you want a very nice uniform radiation pattern all around, this would be a good application for that. But back over to the return loss for a second. So how do we read these kinds of charts? So this is a logarithmic representation of um, the response of that antenna. And so the way that you can kind of think of this is the more negative the number, the less energy is reflected. The closer the number is to zero, and zero being all energy being reflected back, that would be a very bad antenna response. So 3 dB means 50% is getting out. 10 dB means 90% is getting out of the antenna. So the further you go beyond that, you start hitting diminishing returns, but ultimately the deeper this curve can be in the frequency range of interest is good. And then you can kind of say from your own um, calculations of your own link margins, you can determine, you know, what your best band edges would be, which is typically, you know, you know, if you say we want it to be less than minus 10 dB, our band edges would be from there, whoops, would be from there to there. All right, so here's another example of one that can be fired off from that toolkit. This is a quasi Yagi antenna. So you can see kind of unlike this one, which is more omnidirectional around um, the wire, this one is a little bit more directional up off the top. So we have that going up, you know, up through the Z axis here. And this is also, you know, confirmed and shown here in the far field 2D pattern. So this is another one that can, can uh, be kicked out for that. Again, we can see our return loss kind of in that lower range of the 5G NR. This again can be specified for any frequency that we want to, to kind of calculate that out for what you're trying to design. And of course, if you're customizing your own antenna, these are the types of outputs that you would particularly see. Um, this over here, these plots is just going to be another representation of how the gain is depending on the angle or cut that's being taken out specifically. And here's another one. We've got a uh, rectangular insert uh, fed patch antenna. So we've got the feed generated here on the on the uh, bottom or the end of the transmission line. It goes through, radiates the patch. We can see a really narrow band structure. That's what we typically would expect to see for patch antennas. Um, so this would be, you know, by itself, um, you know, used maybe for like a GPS application or for um, you know, again, a very narrow band structure where we want to have a really high gain. But what's great with patch antennas specifically, but, you know, not just patch antennas, but antennas in general, but in the 5G space, I'd say patch antennas is very common, is the implementations of arrays. So HFSS is also able to build these out and duplicate the model so that we can then see what the performance changes um, in the game when we now have two antennas transmitting at the same time. Or if we want to do a four by four antenna. And HFSS also enables us to apply varying magnitudes and phases to each antenna feed. And so what is that? Um, so the phase is just, you know, the, the angle that the, the, the wave is approaching to the um, antenna as at its feed. And the magnitude is, is, you know, how large of a signal that it happens to be. 
And using some of the algorithms um, for beam steering, you can send different phases and magnitudes to individual antenna elements to steer this beam around. So that's how if you have a user down the street, um, you can point that beam to that user and the user can point theirs back to maximize those data throughputs that we were describing. So HFSS is able to uh, enable us to, to build that up. But these are just a couple um, instances that, you know, in the tool, you can just get right up and go in. It is also a nice benefit that it kind of sets you up for success by automatically setting up all the different functions that you would need um, to reduce the learning curve on this particular type of tool. Um, but now let's like think about back to our antenna model for a second. Um, you know, a lot of devices aren't going to just have, you know, just a 5G uh, antenna on them. They're going to have other antennas, and that can be uh, problematic if they happen to operate in similar frequency ranges. So over here, we've got, again, like I mentioned, the same device. We've got our GPS, our Bluetooth, and a cellular. Here we've got a radiation pattern of our Bluetooth shown. Um, and then we have a S parameter plot. Oops. S parameter plots of all three different antenna uh, responses. So the green one here is our cellular response. So we see our cellular works, you know, starting at you know maybe 800 megahertz all the way up through you know three gigahertz, and it kind of favors a couple different areas. Um, and you can kind of see the response changes over uh, those frequencies, and that's respective of how the antenna is designed, the size of its ground plane its proximity to other devices, but that's kind of, you know, how well it re uh, responds. And then in our blue here, we've got our GPS. And then in our uh, red here, we've got our Bluetooth. And then over here, so these are the ones are how much is reflecting off of each of antennas. So think of this pay, this this plot right here as the uh, antenna responses of, you know, how good is the antenna at each frequency? And then over here, this is how much does it couple into the different uh, other antennas nearby. So in this instance, the closer we get to zero means that they are coupled very well um, at that frequency. So here we can see the cell port and the Bluetooth port right at this frequency here. There is uh, maybe about 10 dB of loss observed. So if there uh, is, it happens to be a channel in cellular and Bluetooth is kind of in the same realm, there might be some interference concerns to, to think about there. But this ability gives you the, those types of insights to understand and uh, make sure that you're not uh, interfering with yourself, essentially. Um, trying to avoid that as best you can um, in the implementations is particularly important. But this, again, doesn't necessarily have to just be two antennas. This is, like I mentioned before, uh, any port that we assign inside of HFSS is going to be part of that matrix, um, and that which means that we could see how it interacts. So if we were to have put a port, maybe for example, on this red trace, and we uh, want to see, you know, this happens to maybe operate at a pretty high speed, maybe a harmonic of USB falls up into a range. We could also see what that couples into to determine, are we having a self-quieting issue from our own board? Um, are we having an EMI issue from our board? Is that causing sensitivity concerns within our radios? Another thing too um, that I'll mention as well is, is that from this S parameter response, we're creating that matrix. Um, if we wanted to then take that matrix and bring it into our ANSYS circuit tool, it comes in as like a little schematic block with all the ports that we had assigned within our simulation. And then with that schematic block inside the circuit tool, we can put in different waveforms, whether it's like a modulated waveform uh, of an antenna and or if it's a, you know, a digital signal from a trace. And then we can export that back to compute the EM fields and see what that looks like, what the EMI profile off coming off the board looks like or what the attenuated or reduced um, signal is from one antenna to another, if we have maybe a two uh, you know, transmitter receiver scenario. <clears throat> All right, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about um, SAR specifically. 
So now on the left here, it's the same antenna, but now, uh, or same device, but now we're looking at the radiation pattern of the LTE antenna or the 5G antenna. And um, so that's why it doesn't look like the donut that we saw on the previous page. But now we want to understand what happens when we put this up against the body. So I'll read this little quote down here at the bottom, um, taken from the FCC's uh, website. So SAR is a measure of the rates of RF or radio frequency energy absorption by the body from the source being measured. And in this case, it's a cell phone. SAR provides a straightforward means for measuring the RF exposure characteristics of a cell phone to ensure that they're within the safety guidelines set by the FCC. So this doesn't have to just only apply to cell phones. This applies to essentially any device that is within 20 centimeters of the body. So that could be something that you wear on your hip, that could be an implant, that could be a something that you wear on your wrist. If it's near the body, and if it has a wireless radio on it, SAR is something that you should always be aware of and cognizant of. And depending on how your um, device implementation is, um, it can sometimes be challenging to physically test SAR um, at a lab. Um, there certainly were methods at labs to do it. So labs have phantom models to uh, you know, put your device up against to perform these empirical tests. But especially when you're in the design phase or the ideation phase, when you're first setting up the antenna, you really want to make sure that you don't have a SAR concern before you've already locked down the form factor, you've already built the prototypes, you're already well on your way trying to certify the device. That is not the time to figure out that you're um, having an issue with SAR. And why do we care about SAR? Is because as RF energy is transmitting away from your device, leaving that antenna and coupling and being absorbed by your body, it, that RF energy will cause the tissues in your body to heat up. And so there are imposed limits for SAR to make sure that that does not happen. So what are some of the things, you know, what can we consider for, you know, SAR? Making sure that, you know, your device is far enough away if you can help it. You know, there's there's reason, you know, I think there was a, back in one of the early iPhones, they had to change um, the way that part of the, the frame was to give some additional separation for, um, for passing SAR or making changes to the antenna to, to pass SAR. The, these, are, these can be problematic, um, especially if you're transmitting at you know, appreciable transmit level power um, that you would find in, in some of these radios. So it's something that you definitely want to be cognizant of and uh, keeping into consideration for. Other instances like this that we've seen as well would be um, not just radios, but any device that, you know, happens to be, you know, quote unquote wireless. So other things that would apply here as well would be, uh, for example, wireless charging, where you have, you know, an implant inside the body and you're trying to charge that implant wirelessly. It has a time varying signal through it, typically on the order of several hundred kilohertz to maybe uh, a megahertz or two. HFSS also has the ability for you to visualize and understand how those SAR implications uh, come into play as well. So moving back to kind of um, the, the 5G small cell air arena is, so HFSS, we've talked so far about just, you know, an antenna by itself. And so HFSS is great for simulating um, and understanding the performance of your antenna by itself, but it's also fantastic to leverage when we're trying to implement this into a larger scale environment. So whether that is like we have here, this is a couple city blocks of downtown San Francisco. If we wanted to see how two antennas perform between each other, so we've got one antenna right here at the top of this building, we've got another antenna right here at the bottom of this cross, uh, this intersection. We're able to use our SBR plus solver, which essentially converts these antenna uh, radiation patterns into rays. So rays will shoot off in every direction and hit the different buildings, which have different boundary conditions assigned to them. So you can make up you know, glass, concrete, uh, brick, asphalt, dirt, et cetera. And it will propagate through this environment and we were able to formulate how much 
um, losses incurred. So we can calculate what our link margin happens to be. And we can move these antennas around. We can put many more antennas inside of this scenario. Um, you can even link an existing antenna that you solved by itself into this. Or maybe you're not really an antenna designer, but you're implementing the actual installation of antennas that you're buying off the shelf. There are a number of different, you know, kind of preconceived preset patterns that you can leverage, or like we've shown in that antenna toolkit, you can create something that gives you a good enough idea of what your vendor's data sheet game pattern will be, and then implement this into your deployment area, whether that's a area that you're trying to provide um, local coverage, or if you're trying to provide, you know, observe connectivity of a wireless internet of things network on a, a job site or on a farm or anything of that nature, we can, we're able to kind of visualize that here. We're also able to see the fields as those are um, assigned. So in this instance, we've got the antenna transmitting here. We can kind of see where the areas of those fields are able to propagate and the areas where it's kind of hitting a little bit more of a dead zone. So helping better visualize those multipath effects um, within uh, this type of scenario. And I, for this example, I'm just showing a city block, um, but other instances for, you know, kind of where we would use inside of this realm are also, you know, really prevalent inside of the vehicle, marine, um, automotive, um, defense industries. So taking an antenna, putting it on, you know, a passenger aircraft, um, taking an antenna, putting it on your car, where's the best spot to get our, uh, 5G coverage inside of your car? Um, or where's the best spot to put it inside of your home or office? Um, if, you're, if you're doing deployments um, in that nature, SBR Plus is able to give you those similar types of insights. Um, because especially when we talk about placing it on like a structure, you know, you design your antenna in free space, it's gonna change when you put it on a car. You know, the, the game pattern is gonna change, you now have introduced an additional amount of metal, that's going to have implications onto the overall performance of the antenna. So you want to be able to have a way to understand that. Um, and it can sometimes be a little bit problematic and challenging to really understand what that's going to be at the end, um, you know, implementing it into to the car. It's, it's, it's gonna be much more streamlined and uh, quick to get the answers before having to install it onto a physical actual vehicle, like putting it onto the car and actually measuring, you know, what the performance of it would look like. Okay, so I'm going to do a little bit of a pivot now. Um, so that kind of covers, for the most part, some of the things in the 5G realm. But I know that um, you know Washington Labs have a very broad um, customer base, and I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking a little bit about EMI and emissions as well. So one thing that um, can be a real challenge for anyone in the industry is EMI passing. You know whether it's a you know intentional transmitter test, whether it's an unintentional radiated emissions test, um, whether it's a conducted emissions test, it can always be challenging. Um, a really common one that we see is you know radiated emissions. So the FCC imposes guide uh, imposes limits that you have to go to you know Washington Labs to make sure that you're under where your device is in its normal operation, and you need to make sure that it's not leaking excessive or radiating excessive EMI to violate that limit. And why do we have those limits in the first place? It's because we want to make sure that your, or the FCC wants to make sure that your device is not going to negatively interfere with another device nearby. So, you know, the, the example that I like to use is think you're at a hospital and you have someone on life support and that's plugged into the wall. And then you have someone a floor above with a, uh, masonry drill or a jackhammer doing some renovations and it's plugged into the you know the same outlet that jackhammer or power tool is going to have a lot of noise generated off the motor off the control circuitry and that noise can travel back down the cable and potentially get into other devices so that's why we have those limits um, same thing that you know you wouldn't want your um, your cell phone to stop working when your TV gets turned on um, so that's why we have to do these tests and they can be challenging. You know, there, I think there, I saw a, a, a statistic, I want to say it's, you know, greater, it's certainly greater than 50% of uh, new devices often fail their first spot check at the lab. Um, so 
This is something that can be quite problematic for people. Um, so simulation is a way that you can help gain some additional insights for that. Um, but a lot of customers are kind of in this like, you know, kind of in a, uh, you know, either they don't have a, you know, plastic enclosure where you can't uh, take advantage of any encompassing, you know, Faraday cage effects, but some people will actually have a metal box that they place it in. Um, so HFSS is able to help visualize both types of scenarios. So here we've got a metal box, but not all metal boxes are created equal. Maybe you've got a lot of components in there that are generating a lot of heat. And so you have to put vents inside of it, or you've got holes, or maybe you've got cables coming off of it, or you've got a door. You know, for example, here, we've got a door with, you know, copper fingers on the top side here, some EMI conducting gasket spaced out along this side, as well as a solid strip on the bottom, and then just nothing. There's a little gap here on this right side. What we're able to do is, like we mentioned before with the antenna toolkit, we can use that to just create like a dummy EMI source and bring it in to your enclosure. So you can import your enclosure model in, assign all of the relevant excitations, create an EMI source, and that's going to help um, understand how those imperfections or you know necessities, maybe you need to put a fan in there, and all the EMIs leaking out, this is gonna help you understand you know, what the, the gravity of that is, and maybe there's things that you can do to, to improve upon it. So what the process for that would look like is, is when we click go on HFSS, and that's not just for enclosures, but that's for everything that I've talked about so far. Um, and this is what really, you know, HFSS hangs its hat on and why ANSYS can, you will know, make the claim that HFSS is the gold standard for EM simulation is its mesh. It's, so what we're looking at here is this, all these different blue um, triangles are, actual te are actually tetrahedrons that the solver is automatically assigning and adapting and refining upon. So you'll notice that on like these more broad surfaces, there's not as many, the, the mesh elements are larger, but when we get into the slots, it's much smaller, or the holes, it's much smaller. Even on the inside, it's much smaller. So HFSS is intelligent enough to know and it will refine the areas where it has not reached that convergence that it's looking for. And the convergence is, is essentially like our acceptable error. So we can drive that convergence down to get a very, very accurate result. And then our mesh will be much more refined. Or if we're just still kind of in that ideation phase and we just want to crank through stuff really fast, um, maybe we're doing trying to run it on a, you know, a little bit of a smaller machine and we want to take advantage of, you know, some time savings there. You can, you know, increase the uh, the error amount, and HFSS will solve it to that error, and that's what um, makes sure that you know that you have an accurate simulation, um, and that you can trust the results. It also takes that labor out of your hands, so that a new engineer doesn't get, you know, the daunting idea of, oh, how where how am I supposed to know how dense these are supposed to be for the frequencies that I want? Um, or am I sure that I added enough? And now you're running multiple iterations to make sure that nothing changes. HFSS is going to solve it to what it needs. And then over here on the right, since we're solving all of Maxwell's equations, we can see the outputs on the surfaces as well as radiating through um, different, uh, you know, volumes. So we can also see it radiating off of, you know, and leaving the box. So right now we're looking at the E field on the surface of the box, and you can kind of see what the, you know, the magnitudes happen to look like and see where those areas of, of leakage are coming out. So you can kind of see even here, I think it's even better on this, uh, it's hard to see on that slide, but you can kind of see that over here, we're getting complete leakage off that seam. Down below it's dark blue, which indicates a very low E field level is pretty solid. Those slots are letting a little bit out, and then those fingers look like they're doing a pretty decent job. So, but visualize, visualization of these fields um, is where you're able to help really understand and really you know, see what your enclosure's you know, weak points happen to be. So ours, our example here, we can see that those slots at the top are definitely um, something that might be worth redesigning for the frequency that we happen to be looking at. Some of the other EM fields that come out of an HFSS solution would be the E field, H field, uh, J, which would be like surface currents, um, Q, charge, you know, SAR. And then we can see that both in like a vector or magnitude plot. So we can see the vectors and see the directions of how those fields are going. 
What we're looking at is a magnitude plot. I like the magnitude plots because it allows me to animate that over phase, which once animated will kind of really show you how those fields are traveling and better understand and gain insights into how, um, you know, their, their method of escape may be. And so for any, you know, HFSS users out there in tip, you know, you can add 2D sheets or different coordinate systems to really pick and choose where you want to look. And you don't necessarily have to do that before you run a simulation. You can do that after the fact in post-processing. So you can actually visualize, you know, throughout your entire design um, after just a single simulation. Another tip that I'll mention as well um, is, is that you can manually adjust these scales to um, better gain insights. So this might be, uh, you know, a issue or a kind of maybe tricky to be like, how do I know this is good enough, right? Um, so you can change that scale to say, if I, I know that if I'm seeing this DBE field outside of it, um, I'm, I'm gonna have a problem. So you can adjust this scale to make it be like that limit so that anything that exceeds that limit is gonna be immediately coded in red. You know, anything below that limit would be blue. And so it's just a very, you know, binary uh, representation of showing you if you're, you know, having major issues. It really helps pinpoint that down. But the overall broad scale is nice to look at for um, just understanding trends and visualizing how these fields are coming out. Okay, and then one last kind of thing and sort of still in the EMC realm is, is that, you know, one example is, you know, like I mentioned uh, when I, I might have kind of touched on it a little bit is we have a number of different EMC kind of profiles built into HFSS. So you can understand and implement some of these to, you know, cater to what types of, um, you know, tests you're trying to do. And I'll say this is never going to replace going to the lab. And this is never going to replace spot checking at the lab. But what simulation is going to do is help make sure that you have a greater chance of having success in those spot checks. And if you're having problems, help drone in to the problem and better you know, investigate and understand, get to that root cause um, and gain those further insights. So that was the, um, and then here's just an example of <clears throat> kind of correlated with uh, actual physical measurements. You know, so, you know, the more accurate you refine your model, the closer and closer to reality, you're able to achieve with the, the power of ANSYS HFSS. All right, so um, if this was anything that was really you know, interested, you guys want to learn more, um, this is how you can contact us, um, simulation at ran.com or www.ransim.com. Um, I encourage you to check us out, but I really appreciate uh, your, your attention and uh, your time today. I really enjoyed presenting with y'all. So now um, we're going to go over to the uh, Q&A section of our webinar here. So Kim, you can go ahead and read off some of the questions we got. Yep. And I wanted to say thank you, Matthias, for just such a very informative webinar. Let me go ahead and check to see the questions we have. Right. First question is, how does RAN SIM typically work with clients for EMAG, E-M-A-G, consulting services? Do you have a specific hourly rate or is it price per project? So what we do for, for our projects um, is, so every project's gonna be different. Our, our main goal is to you know, find a, a way that simulation can provide value with you, whether that's helping you acquire the tools or helping you perform a simulation project. Typically our projects are done through a, um, a scoping effort with the customer. So we'll sit down understand the problem, and then propose a solution that um, is going to most often be done in a uh, fixed fixed bid type of project. All right, thank you. Next question we have is, can ANSYS perform optical coupling analysis slash modeling, i.e. what are the highest frequencies that can be managed? On the opposite, in our audio model supported through one of those, sorry, my other question away, um, through one of your tools? That's a great question. So HFSS can simulate well up into the terahertz region. Um, it's all dependent on the overall size of the structure and the um, number of, you know, the computing power, the wavelength size, um, but you can certainly simulate up to very, very high frequencies, well beyond, you know, 100 gigahertz 
but it comes at a cost of, of computational time. Um, but when it comes to optical, we have another group in the optics group, and it can kind of blur the lines, especially when we're talking about you know optical transitions. Um, so HFSS and a tool called ANSYS Lumerical have some parallels in that transitional realm. Um, but we can look to see some additional details if there's uh, if we can make a note of that question specific to that. And then I'll speak on to the audio. So um, HFSS is able to simulate waves down at those frequencies, but it's not going to be the audio phenomena. It's not changing the pressure. It's still an EM wave. Um, but there are other um, acoustics uh, simulation applications within ANSYS. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, next one is, is, hi, thank you for this presentation. What conditions are added in the simulation model for EMI shielding gaskets? Or are these also imported, provided per each manufacturer? Yeah, so for um, shielding gaskets, you know, in this example, they're, they're going to be applied as, you know, kind of the outer surface of what that gasket is. So a gasket is going to um, be made of typically a conducting material and then usually like some piece of foam material inside of it. So we're solving it on the surface of that gasket. We're not solving inside the foam specifically. Um, but if you, but it brings up a great point where different gasketing material is going to have different material assignments. Um, or if we have, you know, EM absorbing materials like ferrites or other absorbing sheets, those are going to have specific material properties. And HFSS enables you to take that vendor's data sheets and recreate um, those properties. Um, and then with, uh, you know, some analysis to confirm that you're, you know, it looks like what you would expect, you have, can then have confidence to bring that into your model um, for implementation. All right, thank you. Uh, next question, on the commercial side, is this, is this a service if we're not busy enough to purchase, license the product? Yes, RAND simulation um, kind of has three pillars of their business. So we are able to facilitate acquiring ANSYS licensing for customers in the small to mid-sized business space. Um, so we work directly with ANSYS to help customers acquire the licenses, but we find that some, some customers don't have either the, uh, the long-term need, maybe it's a one-off project, or maybe they don't have the engineering staff or the bandwidth to perform these types of analysis, and we do consulting services in that realm as well. All right, thank you. Uh, next question, I think you might just answer, but I'm gonna add just to make sure. Um, do you provide trial ANSYS licenses if someone is interested in evaluating ANSYS? Yeah, so I'd say if anyone's interested in evaluating ANSYS, um, I'd encourage you to reach out at that simulationran.com and whether that be a demo or a trial or you know like a collaborative consulting project, we, we will first kind of find, sit down and you know, learn about your problem and then find what makes the most sense um, to implement that. And whether that happens to be a trial to try out the tools, we really like to get be engaged with our trials so that um, you're not just, okay, here's the keys to a Ferrari, go have fun. Um, we want to make sure that you're able to build up that foundation and really understand, um, you know, what's going on so that you're successful and, uh, you know, driving really value out of the tools. All right. Next question says, sounds like you answered this already. What platforms are necessary to run the tool? What OS does the tool run on? Great question. ANSYS HFSS runs on both Windows and Linux. The, I would say the minimum uh, operating conditions or the minimum uh, performance requirements for your machine would be a four cores, four physical cores and I'd say 32 gigabytes of RAM is probably the uh, the lowest end. I think maybe 16 is technically what you're able to get away with. Um, but really, um, the more cores that you have, the faster the simulation is going to run. The more RAM that you have, the bigger the simulation you're able to perform. So RAM is kind of how that matrix gets solved. Um, like I mentioned for that S-parameter matrix. So the bigger your simulation space, the higher uh, your frequency, um, respect to that simulation space. If you're fitting many, many wavelengths inside of a solution domain, um, that's going to drive up the simulation uh, RAM demand. Um, so typically, if you're going to be a heavy user, um, 
we we see people who are, are driving on like 12 core up to maybe 32, 36 core machines and have anywhere from, you know, 128 all the way up to, you know, maybe 500, 768 gigabytes of RAM. But that's a big, broad range. I, would, I don't want to scare anybody away from that. All of those simulations that we've shown today um, were all able to be run on a laptop. Uh, and a little an engineering laptop. I think it's, you know, eight cores and you know, 64 gigs of RAM. So, um, and many simulations fall, you know, in a much more similar sense. So don't dis dissuade you, but if there's more details and if there's really some interest there, um, we have the, you know, we have a number of different recommended machines um, to get the best uh, uh, use out of these tools. All right, uh, next question. How do you apply meshing? Is it a better option than creating an airbox? So the airbox is what bounds our simulation domain. So everything inside of the airbox is going to be simulated. And then the HFSS solver will first go through what's called an initial meshing setup. And so what it's going to do is it's going to take all the different objects inside of your domain uh, or inside your model, and it's going to generate an initial mesh on them. And then it's going to solve Maxwell's equations, you know, the E and H fields at all of those different points. So it's a four-sided structure, a tetrahedron, we call them tets. So at every point in those tets, it's going to solve the, the fields. And then it's going to add some more. And then it's going to do that process again. And then it's going to compare locally to the previous iteration, which we call our adaptive pass. So it's going to say, oh, this one changed a lot this time. So let's add a couple more elements there. This one didn't change so much uh, from last time, so this one's probably doing okay. And so it will continue to adapt and refine that until it reaches, you know, at all points, everything's converged, and then the simulation is able to be evaluated. All right, and do you but One thing I will say, sorry, um, one, one, one caveat there is, is that um, in certain instances, users, and this is very common when you want to get a very fine resolution of the fields in an area. Um, HFSS is able to solve the solution, but you want more uh, refined analysis. You can also manually add in mesh elements to those specific areas to get some additional you know, visual refinements um, or to, you know, if, if the simulation calls for it, you can apply that. But in general, the adaptive meshing process can handle the solutions for you completely. All right. Um, do you offer training courses? Yeah, so we we at RAND can offer uh, trainings um, if there's interest in the tool, so we can help adopt you there. Um, but then also ANSYS has resources called the ANSYS Learning Hub that we can help uh, facilitate to our customers, which has a number of different online trainings and uh, pre-recorded lectures to get you off and running. All right, um, that was actually the last question I see. So if you have additional questions, he's left his contact information up here. I'm sure he's okay with you emailing and reaching out um, to ask additional questions. Again, our thanks goes to Matthias for taking time out to enlighten us about leveraging ANSYS simulations for 5G antenna deployment. Please stay tuned for our next upcoming webinar sometime in January. We are in the process with confirming dates and times with the presenters. So please make sure you visit our website to schedule to our Washington Labs Academy to receive updates. This is easily done by visiting www.wll.com. Again, that is www.wll.com. You wanna click on the training tab in the upper right-hand corner and you'll fill in your information where you see sign up for updates. On behalf of the Washington Labs Academy, we would like to thank you for all attending. I would now end the event. Please enjoy the rest of your day and most importantly, stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. Yes, thank you so much, everybody. Take care.